Good afternoon and welcome to the Laurier Legacy Fireside Chat, the first installment of the public engagement series for the Laurier Legacy Project. Please note that you can turn on or hide the transcript by pressing the CC button on the Zoom menu. This session will be recorded for internal purposes. Recording this event on your own device is prohibited. The recording will be made available to attendees after the presentation. Today's conversation will begin with an address from Dr. Barrington Walker and followed by short presentations from Dr. Caitlin Arak and Dr. Tedla Desta, who will present their preliminary research findings. This will be followed by a Q&A period where you will have the opportunity to ask our panelists questions. For this event, we have collected questions upon registration. Additional questions can be submitted via the Q&A feature on Zoom. Due to time constraints, some questions may, might not be answered, so please submit those questions in the post-event survey, which we will circulate to all those who registered. We hold a zero tolerance policy for comments and or questions that are deemed discriminatory or hateful in nature, and any participant engaging in this form of commentary will be removed from the webinar and those questions will not be answered. We would like to acknowledge that Wilfrid Laurier University and its campuses are currently occupying the Haldeman Tract, which is the traditional territory of the Neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. This land is part of the Haldeman Treaty of October 25th, 1784. The Laurier Legacy Project is a multifaceted public history initiative that will explore the times and legacy of Sir Wilfrid Laurier and Wilfrid Laurier University. The university's namesake, <coughs> excuse me, and former Canadian Prime Minister was a political leader acknowledged as a nation builder whose policy decisions related to immigration and relations with Indigenous peoples resulted in a complex legacy. The Laurier Legacy Project is a scholarly examination of Laurier's life and times and the institutional history of the university that aims to create a better understanding of his legacy and the ways that the past continues to influence the present day through public education. So I'd now like to introduce Dr. Barrington Walker, the Associate Vice President, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and a historian of modern Canada. Dr. Walker will now say a few words to start this session. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Mystery, and thank all of you today uh, for joining us online for this first public engagement and conversation about the Laurier Legacy Project. I'd first uh, like to start with a few words from our Associate Vice President Indigenous, Indigenous Initiatives, Dr. Darren Thomas, who could not be with us today, but who is an important part of the Laurier Legacy Project. And this is his message uh, to members of the community. To date, we have been unable to secure a visiting Indigenous scholar to support the third part of the Laurier Legacy Project. This element of the project is to support the efforts of indigenizing and decolonizing Laurier that the Office of Indigenous Initiatives is tasked with. We are still hoping to meet this requirement when a suitable candidate is secured. The reality is that from the early days of Canada, many politicians enacted legislative and policy decisions based in Western scientific racism that undermine the indigenous civilizations that lived on these lands for thousands of years. Although we are unable to undo the actions of settler colonialism and the associated trauma that resulted from policies like quote unquote Indian residential school, forced adoptions of indigenous children into non-indigenous families, and the banning of traditional indigenous governance and ceremonies. Efforts like the Laurier Legacy Project provides us the opportunity to learn from our collective histories to better inform learners who will enter Canadian society and take up leadership on making the aspirations of Canadian society in which all peoples experience a fair and just existence and making this a reality. So indeed, the Laurier Legacy Project provides an opportunity for the broader community to reflect upon the complex legacy of our namesake, Sir Wilfrid Laurier, and the crucial period of Canadian history, and indeed international history, during which Laurier served as Canada's Prime Minister. It is no exaggeration to say that Laurier and his government both shaped and were shaped by the era during which many of the foundations of modern Canada were established. Many of the key social, economic, cultural, political, and civic elements of Canada were established during this era. Canada's attitude towards the wider world and its sense of place in it was also forged during this time. This project is also a space to learn and reflect about 
and upon the history of Wolfrid Laurier University. Dr. Ted Ledesta has alerted us to the importance of critical university legacy research. Alongside universities such as Harvard, Dalhousie, Cambridge, and Edinburgh, we have started to reflect upon our history. Built on a colonial foundation, Wilfrid Laurier University, similar to other institutions, engaged in practices and created bodies of knowledge that created and fostered various sorts of exclusions. At the same time during its history, Wilfrid Laurier University also provided spaces for fostering intercultural connections and genuine engagement with the broader world. This project is decidedly not about whose name or what name that our university should bear. The purpose of the Laurier Legacy Project is to provide members of the university community with comprehensive scholarly archives of data and primary sources that can form the basis of informed analysis, interpretation, decision-making, conversation, and debate about the history of our institution, its namesake, and the importance of both for thinking about the present and future of Laurier. So with that, I turn the floor over to Dr. Caitlin Arak, who will begin her research presentation. Thank you, Dr. Walker, and good afternoon, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be with you here today um, to discuss the Laurier Legacy Project and the work that we're doing. For my part of the Laurier Legacy Project, I am researching the history of Sir Wilfrid Laurier, his life and times, and also the legacy that he left behind. In 2011, a statue of Wilfrid Laurier was unveiled on campus near the theater auditorium to mark the centenary of the university. In our institution's name is a history that is entangled with the complexity of the historical figure. How we understand our nation's history is constantly evolving as the literature expands on certain topics, as new methods and theories are used to provide an understanding of that history, and as new information is brought to light. I hope that with my research on Sir Wilfrid Laurier, I can provide a grounding for us as a community to have that conversation about the complexity of his legacy about how he viewed the nation, what Canada meant to him and his contemporaries, and the various policies put into place to ensure that vision. Laurier was at the center of many decisions during his decades in federal politics, especially his turn as prime minister. He is even regarded as an architect of modern Canada. Through my research, I will endeavor to explore the many facets of what it means for Laurier to be an architect of Canada and how Canada was in turn shaped by Laurier's vision of nation, and Canada's place in the world. There are several notable biographies of Wilfrid Laurier spanning the 20th century. From Odie Skelton's 1916, The Day of Sir Wilfrid Laurier, A Chronicle of Our Own Time, to Andre Pratt's 2013 Wilfrid Laurier. In the various biographies written about him, Laurier was regarded as a tireless statesman, a great conciliator, and an architect of modern Canada. Henry Barassa, contemporary and political protege turned rival of Laurier said of him at his death, quote, the private virtues of the eminent statesman, his admirable qualities of the heart, that tireless modest charity, the great dignity of his life are reasons for trust and consolation of those who loved him, end quote. Pratt, the biographer, said that, quote, Wilfrid Laurier personified the Canadian vision, end quote, and that, quote, compromise was the key to Laurier's entire career as a public figure, like most great Canadian leaders, he was a conciliator, end quote. His early speeches, Laurier's, in Parliament in defense of Louis Riel, his work to bridge divides between English and French Canada, and his steady vision of Canadian nationalism at imperial conferences were all testaments to his belief in compromise, according to his biographers. Another biographer, Barbara Robertson's 1971 monograph, Sir Wilfrid Laurier, The Great Conciliator, focuses on Laurie's efforts to provide a compromise for the Manitoba schools question. She also talks about how he expanded Canada through increased immigration and development and fought for compromise between French and English Canada at every turn. For Robertson, Laurie's political career was set 
was spent moderating between various parties, finding the middle ground in contentious debates. She states that Laurier, quote, reached right into the hearts of all Canadians who've never responded so unanimously to any politician. Ordinary people like Laurier, not because he was ordinary, for he was not, but because he was responsive. He liked his fellow Canadians. He listened to them, reasoned with them. He did not always carry conviction. As he said, they cheered for him, but they did not vote for him. All the same, those cheers meant something. And the rest of the quote is on your screens. Alongside conciliator and compromise, the other term used in reference to Laurier is the term architect. And this is the phrase that I really appreciate when it comes to studying Laurier. This term comes most notably, most notably from the title of Raymond Tang's 1966 book, Laurier, Architect of Canadian Unity. But it's also used in several of the other biographies to discuss Laurier's vision for Canada, his work while prime minister, and in reference to his famous speech given in Toronto's Massey Hall on 14th October 1904, where Laurier stated, let me tell you, my fellow countrymen, that all the signs point this way, that the 20th century shall be the century of Canada and Canadian development. For the next hundred years, Canada shall be the start towards which all men who love progress and freedom shall come, end quote. And I think the term architect provides the perfect starting point for my research, as this term is multifaceted enough to encompass the complex history and memory surrounding Laurier. To be an architect is to design, to construct, and to configure. For my work, understanding what it means to call Laurier an architect of Canada is pivotal to unravel the complexity of his legacy and how that legacy has built modern Canada as we know it today. So a little bit of a biography might be helpful in framing this project. So Wilfrid Laurier was born in Canada East, now Quebec, in 1841. He was a seventh generation French Canadian. By 1864, he had graduated from McGill Law School and opened his own practice. By the age of 30, Laurier was elected to the Legislative Assembly of Quebec for the Quebec Liberal Party. Within the next few years, Laurier advanced to federal politics as he was elected to the House of Commons as a Liberal in 1874. He remained in federal politics for the next 45 years, serving as leader of the opposition from 1887 through 1896, and again from 1911 through 1919 and his prime minister from 1896 through 1911, which is the longest uninterrupted term of any prime minister in Canadian history. During those years in federal office, Laurier made a name for himself as a great orator and as a stalwart politician. Under his leadership, Canada gained two new provinces. The National Transcontinental Railway was built to give more direct access to the prairies and Northern Ontario and Quebec. He negotiated a recipro reciprocity agreement with the United States to expand trade, and was a leader in the major debate about religion and language between French and English Canada. He also argued for Canadian nationalism at imperial conferences and expanded immigration efforts, increasing the population of Canada. Most of these topics are at the center point of discussions of his work in office presented in the various biographies and literature about him. And while they're all fascinating areas of research, my intentions for this project are to expand into other areas that are encompassed by this idea of architect of nation. As Canada expanded westward, greater numbers of migrants were accepted to populate those lands with European inhabitants. Between 1897 and 1914, approximately a million migrants arrived in Canada. This increased the country's population by over 40%. Discussions of who should be considered for immigration into Canada and how the country should develop resulted in rigid immigration policies that were based upon racial and ethnic preference. To ensure this hierarchical order of preference for immigration, in 1900, Liber Laurier's Liberal Party raised the Chinese head tax to $100. In 1905, it was raised again to $500. And in 1908, the Continuous Journey Regulation was added as an amendment to the Immigration Act to prohibit the landing of any immigrant who did not come to Canada by continuous journey from the country of which they were natives or citizens. These immigration policies were a result of continued and expanding anti-Asian anti sentiment felt on Canada's west coast that expanded to the rest of Canada. 
peoples of Asian descent were not the only group restricted under Canada's narrow vision of identity. In August 1911, Laurier's Liberal government implemented Order and Council PC 1911-1324, which was designed to keep out Black Americans from the United States, particularly Black Americans escaping segregation in the American South, because they were, quote, deemed unsuitable to the climate and requirements of Canada, end quote. This order was cancelled on October 5th, 1911. Discussions of identity and race were central in these immigration policies and were a part of Laurier's vision of Canada, and they're still embedded in the fabric of modern Canada. Canadian expansion westward also involved increased interactions with greater numbers of Indigenous peoples, resulting in discussions and expansion, and expansion of the reserve system, residential school policy, um, which expanded greatly in this era, and treaty obligations. In my research into the history and legacy of Wilfrid Laurier, I am most intrigued by the policies and practices that created his vision of Canada in fully fleshing out what it meant to be an architect of Canada. Laurier is remembered as an architect of modern Canada, and I want to fully explore what this term means, including immigration policies and Canadian expansion westward, which aren't as discussed in the literature, but also questions about how Laurier regarded Indigenous peoples, marginalized peoples and groups, and the ways in which racism and settler colonialism were embedded in the nation and its policies, and in how these entangle with foreign policy, imperial relations, and even economics and trade policies. Thinking about Wilfrid Laurier as an architect allows for a multifaceted analysis of the various ways in which he envisioned and built Canada, modern Canada. And I think it allows for a more nuanced understanding of the various intersections between the many aspects of his history and legacy. Sir Wilfrid Laurier's legacy is one of complexity. And I hope that with my work for the Laurier Legacy Project, I can provide a deeper insight into what that complexity encompasses. Thank you. And I look forward to any questions you may have. And with that, I will turn the floor over to my colleague, Dr. Ted Ledesta. Thank you so much. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, good afternoon again. My name is Ted Ladesta, uh, but the picture that you see here is not my picture, it's not my photo, but I'll tell you more about her. Um, her name is Rosalind Kaler, and she has a very um, strong- Ted La, I'm just gonna stop you. Um, you haven't okay. shared your screen yet. Not yet? Okay, sorry. Oh, no? Perfect. Eh? Yeah. Okay, great. So I was speaking about uh, this photo, the photograph, the photo that you see on the right hand side of the screen. Um, her name is Rosalind Kaler, and she has a very um, relationship with the, our university. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about her. Uh, the end of the last slide is about her. Um, so the institutional dimension of this research, uh, which I'm focusing on, which is basically the campus history, um, has its own framework, methods, and goals. So in terms of framework, I am following a um, very much balanced and nuanced lens um, to analyze the history of the, univers the university. So institutional studies and institutional history research usually studies the events, uh, images, policies, practices, procedures of the institutions. And um, it looks at the positives and the negatives of, uh, specifically here in this case, I'm looking at this positive and the negative aspects and basically the framework uh, that I'm following uh, focuses on these two aspects. So in the positive sense, I'm speaking about the inclusivity, um, the inclusive community, the decolonial practices or policies, um, or in other words, the equity framework. And looking at the negatives, I'm focusing on the colonial history, discriminatory practices, anti-equity cases, injustice, or exclusionary currents. 
Um, so the question would be, where there's such cases? Can we see any cases of such nature? And to what extent were they shown? Um, and I'm also asking at the same time, although it's an institutional history project, I'm asking about today, what's happening today. Can we reflect about today too? Um, in terms of methods, it's an in-depth case studies approach uh, of the untold institutional history of the university. It's not a comprehensive and definitive history of the university because it's not possible to do this uh, within the project period. Um, and I'm using um, several uh, research methods, archival research, bibliographic and historiographic sources are used and oral history too. So for example, um, the university, Wilfred Laurier University archives and special collections holds about 1,647 linear meters of records and estimated 40% of this collection is the university's records. So I'm plowing through images and primary materials contained in this archive. Um, so what's the goal? So the goal is, first of all, building a repository or a foundation of archival collections uh, using this framework I mentioned earlier, and also making this um, archival material more easily searchable and discoverable um, because it's very difficult to look and find materials that are or archival records that are related to the history of the university in terms of inclusion or exclusion. Um, finally, th there is a potential of publishing, uh, publishing journal articles. Um, uh, so you might see an article uh, published at the end of this project. Books on Wilfred Laurier University. So I have been able to look at several books that were published regarding the university. The first one is Leadership and Purpose. This was published in 2011 during the centennial celebration of uh, the university. Um, the second one is towards, uh, Toward an Indigenous and Lutheran uh, Ministry in Canada uh, that was published in 1988. Um, these two below, the ones you see at the bottom, are more of photographic or pictorial books. Uh, and this two, I remember Laurier and Waterloo College, recollections of Waterloo College, are memoirs, the memoirs of, uh, you know, faculty members who worked at the university before or staff members. So in a sense, they are not really critical. So our approach is more of critical uh, or what is untold or what is hidden in the history of the university. Um, these books, what they have in common is that they are celebratory. And they are, all, they are also hagiographic, uh, chronological, and there are elements that are missing in this history, uh, in this uh, box. Now, let's look at current and ongoing and also previous recently completed uh, public history projects uh, by various universities in North America and um, uh, Europe. So the first one, I feel our approach is somewhat similar to this one, uh, is the project completed by the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, so what they conducted was a two-year project and more of they used um, multiple narratives to analyze the positive and negative aspects of their uh, history. But I would say this was dominant, the dominant aspect of their case studies were the negative, uh, the discriminatory, the racist, and the bad aspects of the university's history. So our approach is a bit different, as I said earlier, because we look at the success, the remarkable aspects of the university too, because history is nuanced. Uh, universities have nuanced history too. Um, but the interesting thing about this project is that they completed the project a few months ago, and they have changed this project into a permanent center. So they called it now the Rebecca Blank Center for Campus History. So they have a permanent employee now, and what they're doing is they are educating the campus's past, the community, to enrich the curriculum, inform administrative decisions, 
and to achieve more equitable university. In a way, they are linking it to the present and they are studying what's happening currently based on what we have learned from our public history project. The second example is the Hopkins retrospective. This is another campus history project. Uh, I would say this is one of the first ones. Um, it's based on Johns Hopkins history uh, and his legacy. Um, it started in 2013 and it's still ongoing. It's continuing, it's a multi-year project. Um, they are asking where Hawkins received, uh, how he made his investments, money, and how the university um, transformed it to where it is today. Another example from the UK, um, the city of Edinburgh and the University of Edinburgh. This is a joint project between the city government and the university. And they are using a single narrative, a single lens perspective, which is the exploitation uh, of human beings, human labor, and colonialism to fund and start the university and its impact on the city of Edinburgh. Um, they have completed their project too. Um, and uh, the very interesting thing about this project was that it was a collaboration of the university community plus the city government plus what they called citizen historians. These are ordinary people, ordinary members of the public who have an interest in history, but are not really trained historians or academic. Um, the last one among the many is the Harvard University case. Uh, Harvard also used the single narrative, which is the human exploitation aspect and how that resulted in the foundation of the university. And, because this has been usually hidden part of the university's history. They have um, um, uh, you know, uh, divulged this and published a report. Finally, they produced a comprehensive report. It's not a case study approach that they used. Now let's come back to our own university and let's look at the first the exclusionary cases or categories, which I call. These are broader categories. So we'll have many subcategories under each of them. Uh, but these three main categories might also increase at the end of uh, the project. So the first one is the land issue or the coloniality lens. Um, so currently there are several projects in South Africa, Europe, and North America based on the land and university relationship. Uh, some of them call it universities as settler colonial landholders. Uh, the others call it university land grabs, or they call it indomitant lands, or the dispossession of indigenous lands. Um, so they are studying this in terms of their, their university's presence in this indigenous lands. And something that I'm closely aware of is the University of Toronto and McGill are studying the endowment land aspect of their own universities and history. So that universities were granted land and they, invest, they used that land to make further investment, to lease it and fund their own um, uh, business or uh, projects. The second aspect or the second main category of my preliminary finding in terms of exclusionary cases is the anti-Black racism. Um, so I'm sure you are aware of equity documents or even institutional histories uh, studying um, their history, they would refer usually to invisible minorities, which I think is a misnomer of what is really um, uh, pressing or important, which is anti-Black racism. That should be the correct name. Uh, but I think since the past two years, there has been a focus or explicitly naming, defining, and addressing anti-Black racism within institutions. Uh, a good example of this is now York uh, School Board conducted its own comprehensive anti-Black racism research within its own schools. Uh, we can look at the Scarborough Charter. If you have time, please look at this charter. And recently I looked at two vacancies, university vacancies by Carleton University and Windsor University. They are specifically looking for professors of anti-Black racism. So there's a gross 
in terms of awareness and, and attempt to grapple with this issue. Um, so what I'm saying here is there are so many cases in the university system that I found from the archives that show presence of the practice, images, policies of anti-Black racism. Um, and finally, the third segment in terms of the exclusionary cases is sexism and protesters. Also, I found so many cases of images, practices, policies, and protests related to sexism uh, in the university's history. And there were protesters related to this, but also outside this resistance. So you will see them uh, probably at the end of the project. Inclusivity or the positives. Like I said, universities or campus history is not only negative, it's also positive. There are remarkable cases. So when it comes to Wilfrid Laurier University, the successes and the positive remarkable histories, some of them are due to luck uh, um, and some of them are due to effort, they are earned. Uh, so first of all, I was not able to find any direct international colonial or resource exploitation role in with, that links the university to these kinds of things. Um, I can give you an example. There was a program involving McGill and the University of Toronto to send graduates to colonial countries or services. Um, Wilfred Laurier was not involved in this. Um, and unlike Dalhousie, Cambridge, or mostly Ivy League schools, which were founded or had direct income resources from the exploitation of human beings, particularly Africans, and also the exploitation of resources from the global south and African resources to fund and, and, and um, build their universities, you don't see that kind of case, which is a positive. Also, there is no direct residential school role. Um, for example, if you look, at, at the, I know there are currently studies going on by the University of Ottawa and its links to Catholic residential schools. It was originally the seminary for the Oblate Order and also Western schools links between an Anglican residential school and the original seat of Western, which is here on college. So you don't see that kind of direct or even in direct role in residential schools when it comes to Wilfred Gloria University. Another very remarkable thing is that there is a wise a practice or a trend of wise naming of buildings, centers, monuments, and memorialization at Wilfred Gloria University. Uh, recently, there was an issue at the University of Toronto regarding the, room, uh, the removal of a portrait and a plaque of Isaiah Bowman. Uh, at the, Wilfred, uh, at the University of Waterloo. And also the memorial of Tobias Rostat in the chapel of Jesus College at Cambridge University used a huge controversy. Um, so you don't see that kind of thing in, uh, at Wilfred Laurier University. Most of our centers, buildings are named after former students, former professors, former administrators. And there is a remarkable history case studies of social justice, decolonial activities um, in the university by the university students, bodies, administrators. Um, now, finally, we are here. So who is Rosalind Keller? Um, in the 1960s, uh, Waterloo Lutheran University, that's our previous name, was a host of the Miss Canadian University pageant. That was the largest pageant in Canada. So Rosalind Keller was the Miss Lutheran, Miss Waterloo Lutheran University of 1964. Um, the newspaper here, the student newspaper, the court called her Queen Rosalind Keller. And the first paragraph I read, a pretty 19 year old, Liberian will represent Waterloo University College in the second Miss Canadian University Snow Queen contest held in conjunction with the university's annual winter carnival from January 29 to February the 1st. I find this really, really interesting and it's really a trailblazer. Um, 
So another thing about Rosalind Keller was that she also was awarded, she was quite active. Uh, I can see her in many student newspapers, um, many student um, publications, and she was also awarded uh, an award for being one of the best athletes of the year, 1965. And in May, uh, on May 22nd, 1967, she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology. Now, historians and people who would be interested in contextualizing and analyzing this might assess and analyze this in terms of the local and global events at the time, but based on my assessment and judgment, I feel the student cohort of that time in the administration of the time did actually decolonize Eurocentric beauty standards and they have actually left a great anti-racist legacy. I really, really want to thank Amanda Oliver, the head of archives and special collections at Wilfred Laurier University. With that, I will uh, turn it back to our moderator. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to both for those really fascinating presentations. Um, so now we'll begin our question and answer session, and we'll, be, uh, we'll begin by addressing some of the pre-submitted questions first. So please submit any additional questions that you might have through the Zoom Q&A function. Um, just want to let you know that due to time constraints of the event, some questions might not be answered. Um, so please submit those questions in the post-event survey, which we will be sharing with registrants after the event. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Walker. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hina. Uh, thank you to uh, Caitlin and, and, and Tedla for uh, two very um, engaging and nuanced talks. Um, as uh, Hina, Dr. Mystery said, we're going to turn now to our Q&A uh, portion. I'm going to start uh, by, by reading um, and partially answering um, some of the pre-submitted questions. Um, and uh, Dr. Uh, Arak and, and, um, and um, Dr. Desta uh, will also um, join me in, in addressing some of these questions. Um, just want the audience to bear in mind that some of these questions were partially answered, um, at least partially with the presentations uh, that were given and some of my own remarks, but we'll endeavor to answer as many of these questions as we can uh, before moving on to um, the, uh, the live questions from you, the audience. So in the meantime, please think about what questions you might wanna pose. So the first question uh, for myself and the other panelists is, uh, the, the first pre-submitted question, uh, did you research into how WLU changed its name from Waterloo Lutheran University into Wilfrid Laurier University? And if so, how did that inform your work? And I will, I will ask um, Dr. Desta to address that question. Okay, um, thank you. So, Based on my historiographic sources and reading, um, the university was struggling financially at that time when it was called Waterloo Lutheran University, uh, and it was being funded by the Lutheran Synod and uh, at the same time by the province. Um, so one of the terms of the provincial uh, administration, the province uh, was to, for the university to remove um, the word Lutheran from its name so that it gets uh, funding and becomes a public university. So they have to set up a special committee to look for names and suggest names. And uh, the committee was made up of uh, people like James Brightop and people like uh, Waterloo, uh, the, the mayor of Waterloo uh, and Professor um, uh, and also another representative from the staff. So they had about 200 names suggested, um, which included places, um, regional, uh, regionals, uh, regional cities, and also names uh, making the use of the initials WLU, or this acronym. And finally, they conducted a poll, uh, which, was, which included Ali Minai and also student uh, participants. Uh, the winner was Wilfred Laurier University, and uh, it garnered about 
500 volts. Uh, although out of the 600 ballots that were distributed, they only received about 1,065 ballots. That was the return, which is around 20% participation. Um, Wilfred Laurier was followed by Grand Valley, Central Ontario, Wilson, Upper Canada University, Kitchener University, and McKinsey University. These were the other um, names that received votes. The committee actually finally admitted that the initials play their role in their decision. And that's because WLU and the initials had, or they had an authority in the academic circles across Canada. So they wanted to keep that. Uh, but there might have been other external factors to which I will uh, be studying in the future. Uh, and the second part of the question is how did the name change inform your work? Uh, so I feel that we do need to ask if the name change was, uh, I mean, from Waterloo Durham University to Wilfred Laurier University was the proper memorialization of the land and the community. Uh, and importantly, um, how did that provincialization and the new board affect the institution? Uh, that's the key part of my question, my uh, interest. It's also useful to ask if there were salient reasons, I mean, uh, latent reasons uh, for the name change, uh, such as external influences. Uh, finally, I would say I'm trying to assess if there were visible changes in practice, policies, and ideologies before the name change and after the name change. Um, and how it's shaped the trajectory uh, of the university. Thank you. Thank you, Tedla. The next two questions I'm going to take as uh, as one uh, as a two parter, and I'll address uh, the questions um, uh, that have been posed. So the first is, what is the intended outcome of the legacy project? Um, I think our, our uh, panelists have spoken to that, but I'll speak to it just a little bit more. And secondly, how will WLU work to decolonize its future and ro what role will its namesake play in this? So um, again, as, as I think was mentioned a few times during the, the Laurier Legacy Project, this, this project is, a, is about a scholarly um, investigation, a, a community conversation um, about, uh, about Wilfrid Laurier and his life and times and about the, the history of our institution. So what we really hope um, will result from this um, is that we will, as a university community, have a repository, um, have an archive of work um, you know, in, in, various, um, in, in various forms, uh, various media um, that will inform uh, what we know about the history of our university and what we know about our namesake, because right now, um, the fact of the matter is, uh, we have much to learn um, about both of those things. Uh, there's quite a bit of, of, um, of a, a man, a, there's an extensive manuscript archive at Library and Archives Canada. Um, there is um, a relatively extensive archive uh, that, that Tedla has been searching through of the history of our university. And as Tedla mentioned, there are some, there's a body of work that's been written about the university, but it's, it's, it's time for um, us to, to pull these things together um, and, and create a, an archive and a repository in which, upon which we can have some um, informed and nuanced conversations as a university um, community. In terms of how WU will work to decolonize its future, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Darren Thomas is, is not here. He spoke a little bit um, in his um, comments about the third part of this project, which is to um, secure a visiting Indigenous scholar um, uh, to, to inform practices of decolonization and give us that decolonizing lens um, in terms of um, how we imagine uh, Laurier as a more inclusive, welcoming community and really coming to grips with the colonial uh, foundations of the university as many universities have done um, across uh, the sector. And I think we need to think about decolonization in many ways, right? In terms of our relationship with the colonial state and in terms of the role that universities have traditionally had for generating the knowledge uh, that underpinned uh, um, colonization, the dispossession of Indigenous peoples. And again, Dr. Thomas would be able to speak about those issues uh, better than I. Uh, but I think um, 
you know, the work that Dr. Um, Thomas is doing with his, um, with his strategic plan and with the scholar that we hope to bring in uh, will give us again those lenses and some um, concrete action plans and some steps that we can come, that we can, that could use towards, um, towards decolonizing. So uh, the next question is, um, and I will ask um, both uh, Caitlin and Desta to, to answer uh, this question or to, to share some thoughts. Uh, what motivated you to be a part of this project? So uh, Tedla, do you care to start? Okay, yeah. Um, so before coming to Laurier, uh, I worked at, uh, under the supervision of uh, um, an educational historian at the Faculty of Education uh, in Queen's University. And that's where I formed my interest in decoloniality and education and history. So that was something that I really wanted to pursue. And my research uh, interest developed in that area. So that's one of the factors. Uh, but basically, uh, secondly, the, the fact that this project is quite interdisciplinary. Uh, it, it, it's about history, public history. It's about EDI, and it's also about education. And that's also attractive. Um, and finally, it's, it's my passion uh, for social justice uh, and equity. Uh, thank you, Caitlin. Um, hello. Okay, so I mm, I completed my PhD on immigration history um, and kind of the history of post Confederation Canada, um, and specifically looked at post World War II. So a lot of the immigration policy in the post war era starts shifting, um, and I guess. A lot of what drew me to this project was kind of looking back a little bit further to understand kind of where some of these policies and practices began, um, but also thinking more broadly about what Canada means, right? How Canada was developed, how modern Canada came to be. Um, so for me, this project is really important in the sense that I get to study a prime minister who was foundational to developing how we see modern Canada but also because I get to look at a side of this prime minister that isn't particularly commented on in the biography. Um, I've studied Canadian history since undergraduate. It is something I am quite passionate about. I love it. The stories you can find in Canadian history are so, so interesting, but they can also be, I'm very curious as to what the full story is, right? In any, in any historical monograph that you read, that you can only fit so much into those books. And every time I pick up recently, especially biographies of Laurier, I am blown away by the differences in each of these biographies, right? They can only focus on so many things. And I'm finding this out in delving into the archives. There is so much material there that really scholars could work on this project for decades. And I think there would still be questions we could ask um, of the archival record. So I think for me, something that really does draw me to this project is thinking about those other aspects of nationalism, of modern Canada, um, of how policies and practices of settler colonialism are embedded in national narratives, are embedded in national um, identity, but also the ways in which specific identities are codified and kind of expanded upon by different visions of Canada. Laurie had a very specific vision of what he thought Canada, Canada should look like, and he worked tirelessly to develop that. And I really want to expand on exactly what that meant. Thank you both for those very thoughtful answers. Uh, another question that we have, another pre-submitted question is, um, and I'll pull this, pose this to both of you, and uh, Caitlin, I'd like you to, to, uh, to start. Uh, is there a vital lesson um, you learned from this project? Yes. Um, so I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned about this project. Um, one of the biggest questions I go into this with um, is reading about some of the immigration policies in particular, right? Who is excluded? Who is included? And why? 
Um, so one of the lessons I am learning and going through this is kind of to continually keep an open mind about what inclusion and exclusion mean at different moments of history. Um, in particular, I've been reading a lot about ideas of whiteness, right? Canada was very much developed in Laurier's era as white Canada, but what does that actually mean? I think it's one thing for us to say, sit here and say white Canada, and it's another thing entirely to actually fully understand what that means and who actually is included in those labels and who isn't. Um, a lot of the biographies actually talk about race, which I've been finding very interesting because their discussions of race are not, when I began this project, I have some very clear understandings of what, what race studies kind of looks like. Um, and it's interesting that in for Laurier, race was French versus English Canada, right? So how, how that kind of mentality affects how modern Canada is built is something that is a question that I am hoping to try and answer at least in part during this project. Thank you, Caitlin. Tedla? Yeah, so the vital lesson from this project um, is that critical institutional uh, history research is really fundamental uh, if, if, uh, for present uh, current uh, policies, uh, activities, and work. Uh, and, and it's really essential if we genuinely and decisively uh, want to grapple with present challenges uh, we face as diverse society. Uh, institutional history is not just about, you know, uh, reckoning with, with the past, it's also about the present. Because uh, like I presented earlier, uh, it's sometimes the, mis the misguided uh, and sometimes the unchallenged uh, policies practices, trends, or events, and displays or images uh, of the past that are affecting us today, that still affect us today. Uh, they continue to cause tensions, frictions, uh, even mistrust, uh, where you know, the gift of the earth or the institutions uh, are not really you know, or equally enjoyed by all of us. Uh, so sometimes I hear some people saying, you know, this person or this official made that kind of undiplomatic statement or even drafted uh, that kind of policy uh, based on what was done or what was practiced at that time, based on the norm of the time. Uh, so what's wrong with it? Why should we care today? Um, but the question really is, has that changed it? or have those policies, trends, practices, displays, the stereotypes, the prejudice that existed within institutions and within our individual minds, have they changed it? Uh, so if they have not changed it, really, this is fundamental. In order to change today and also draft better policies tomorrow, it is important that we critically look at the past. Um, because yeah, like I said, I hear uh, it, uh, the, la the, the, the language insensitive communication that this place, the practices and so on, or even the brutalities of the past are repeating themselves. Um, you know, and I believe there are some sectors, not only universities or, uh, you know, institutions of higher education, which is, which is quite remarkable, that should only study their past or conduct institutional histories. There are at least three sectors based on my own experience, you know, as a parent of uh, children, black children who are going to elementary schools, I feel that there are some sectors that need to conduct institutional uh, self-examination. Uh, this can be um, the health sector, uh, policing, and school boards. They really need to conduct their own uh, institutional self-examinations too. Um, yes, that's my answer. Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Caitlin and Tedla. The next question um, is for me. Uh, what changes do you foresee uh, needing to happen at Laurier given the outcome of this project? Uh, you know, I think for me, um, this gesture to something that I said earlier is that as an institution, 
um, we have very little um, knowledge and as a community about uh, the history of our university. And I don't say that as a sort of blanket statement. Um, as Tedla pointed out, there have been um, works that have been written about the history of Wilfrid Laurier University, but they tend to be quite celebratory, hagiographical in their orientation. Um, so that's one of the changes that I would like to see come out of this project. And our co my co-panelists mentioned this as well, is that we have a more uh, sophisticated and nuanced understanding of uh, the history of the university. And similarly um, with uh, Wilfrid Laurier um, himself, his government, his times. Um, so, you know, fostering that conversation, building that repository of knowledge, uh, if the question is talking about sort of more um, policy changes, um, sort of more granular things that, you know, my view of this project is that this is, uh, this will give us um, the data, uh, the research upon which we can begin to have those conversations. And I think those conversations about uh, some of the changes that some of us would like to see in the Laurier community have taken place in other spheres. And I, I point to some of the strategic work around uh, making Laurier a more inclusive, uh, welcoming space for people from various backgrounds. Uh, the work that, that I've done, the work that other folks have done in the um, in the EDI space, um, as well, the work that is being done in Indigenous initiatives. I think it's part of the same um, part of the same conversation. So, but we, we have work to do it to continue um, to find those more um, action oriented and, and granular things to make this um, community more inclusive. Okay, so let's just keep going um, with the questions to make sure that we have time um, for the live questions. Again, we might not get through all of these, but we're going to try. Um, so I'm posing this uh, question to both Caitlin and Tedla. Um, has the project addressed the issue of inclusion of First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and urban Indigenous peoples? Any thoughts on, um, on that question? Um, so one of my major research questions in this project is about Western expansion um, and the increased number of European migrants that led to policies that affected the lives of Indigenous peoples. So thinking about when Canada is expanding as a nation, you can't exclude all of the policies and practices um, about, towards, on the lives of Indigenous peoples in this country. Um, so under that system, the reserve system is expanded. Um, and as time went on for the restrictions are put on Indigenous peoples, limiting their ways of life, ceremonies, and even movement off of reservations. Um, so all of these are questions and topics that I am hoping to get a more nuanced answer about in the archives of Wilfrid Laurier, um, including residential schools, right? So they predate Laurier's time as prime minister, um, but under him, the residential school system is expanded. Um, and in 1907, there was even a report by Dr. Peter Bryce, who was the Ontario Public Health Officer, and he documented illness and death of Indigenous children in the institutions and advocated for better conditions, a plea that was largely ignored by the then Liberal government under Laurier, um, or under the then Conservative government, and the opposition didn't make any comment about it either. So there is... There's a lot to, I think, unpack um, in the archival record about how Laurier's liberals and even Laurier's government when he is leader of the opposition, how they responded to Indigenous peoples. And one of the things that I'm hoping to have time for in this project um, and work that I think really does need to be done more thoroughly um, is... Indigenous people's own responses to these policies, right? I, I just mentioned a lot of things that were done by the Canadian government of the time period, but I also want to say that Indigenous peoples are also protesting for their own rights in this period. They are not, they are not a silent entity in this project by any stretch of the imagination. And I really hope that I can at least start to kind of create space for their voices to still be present in this research. Um, because they are very important in this research. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rack. Uh, Dr. Desta, any quick thoughts on that question of uh, 
um, of uh, yeah. in indigeneity, the inclusion of First Nations, uh, Inuit, Métis, and urban Indigenous peoples? Yeah, I've quite told. Um, I briefly mentioned this uh, on uh, what I was describing about the land issue. Um, and that's we are addressing or we are looking for archival uh, material and also conducting oral research with elders uh, uh, regarding the land uh, where the university is located. Uh, the issue of seeded and unseeded land is also being addressed by that. So in a way, we are uh, really addressing that uh, by conducting this kind of, you know, data collection and probably there might emerge a scholarly article after all this. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Desta, let's continue to move through these pre-submitted questions. Uh, there is one here that mentions uh, a name change that I'm going to skip over because it's also being posed in some of the live questions that I've been seeing and I'll address, there's a, there are a few of them um, that I will just address um, as one and I would encourage people to, to post follow-up questions if they wish if they wish around that issue. Um, so the question I'm going to pose for Dr. Rack is, can you please speak to Sir Wilfrid Laurier's leadership in relation to anti-immigration policies and legislation during his time in office, and to how you think Laurier can contend with this history as an institution that welcomes many new refugees and immigrants as students, faculty, and employees? All right. So. I can at least speak to the first part of that question, I think, quite well. So as I mentioned in my presentation, under Laurier's government, um, the population of Canada expanded over 40%. Um, as the West was expanded, there were extensive conversations in, in Parliament about who should be included and that kind of image we get and are constantly told in the narrative about immigration history is this stalwart peasant in the sheepskin coat, right? E opening the door for Eastern European migrants. Um, and a lot of research has been done into that, which I can definitely speak to if anyone is interested, like send me an email. <laughs> um, but as for exclusionary policies, um, under Laurier's government, they're predating Laurier's government, but expanded drastically under Laurier's government is um, anti-Asian racism. Um, is prevalent across Canada. It really starts in BC um, with the increased number of Chinese migrants making their way to the shores of Canada. Um, but it quickly expands across Canada, right? A lot of Chinese migrants work on the railways. And as they expand further eastward and westward, those sentiments of racism are very much present. Um, for many in government at this time period, the idea of Canada as a British colony is very, very important. Um, but under Laurier's government, it's really interesting to see all of the imperial discussions that are going on and what it means to be British, right? So one of the discussions that is ongoing is in that British kind of imperial relations discussion in Canada is who actually counts in that British identity, right? So under Laurier's government, we see a lot of policies enacted to restrict marginalized individuals from entry into the country, whether that is um, Black settlers from the United States, which I mentioned in my talk, also people from the British West Indies. are They are discussed quite extensively in the record um, about how to limit their number from can coming to Canada. Right. So a lot of these race issues were relegated um, kind of to a French English discussion, a British discussion, as it were. But there's so many different communities who very much get put to the side in that conversation and excluded based on those categorizations of who should be considered good Canadians that are ongoing with the development of Canada as a nation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Um, Iraq. Um, I will just quickly say about the second part of the question about how Laurier can contend with its history as an institution um, that welcomes, with this history as an institution that welcomes any new refugees and immigrants as students, faculty, and employees, um, that I think that uh, virtually every um, institution, every historical colonial institution in Canada um, is is in that position, right, where there's a, there, there are histories of of various sorts of exclusions um, that we need to know about 
um, if, if to have an informed sense of who we are and, and where we come from, but also um, to think very carefully and critically about the sorts of the sort of institution that we need to be, right, or, 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 or the sort of institution that we want to be, rather. Um, and I think all institutions hold that kind of tension. Uh, and um, I think it's the, the the tension that we work through as we think as a university community about how to make this um, a more, more welcoming um, institution. I don't, I don't believe um, that we are condemned um, or any colonial institution is necessarily condemned by a past of exclusion. Uh, but I, I do believe that you have to squarely reckon with it and work towards a more equitable future. Um, I think this will be the last question um, from the pre-selected, or the not pre-selected, sorry, the pre-submitted questions. Um, how does the, and I, I'd ask, I'll, I mean, I'll start and I'll ask um, Caitlin Tedla to, to weigh in on this as well, because I think you have some thoughts about this as well, but how will the university navigate learning and unlearning of the broader community to determine the best path forward? Um, I think the answer to the previous question gestured to this um, somewhat, I think, that um, you know, Tedla spoke to some of the hagiography around um, the history of uh, of the university. Some and I spoke to some of the silences, and so has Caitlin around um, what we know about about Laurier um, as an individual, um, what we know about um, the times in which uh, he lived, um, and you know, there is some there is some lear some learning to be done around uh, fleshing out a more comprehensive. Um, picture and unlearning some of the easy, um, I think, you know, um, celebratory histories uh, that surround both our understanding of the institution and our surrounding of, um, of Wilfrid Laurier University. And I think as a, as a university community, having a project that's based on um, research and that kind of informed conversation, um, it, it makes us um, well-placed uh, in comparison to other institutions that I've heard from, I won't mention them, but non-universities, institutions that aren't universities that are grappling with similar kinds of questions around their legacy. And they, they envy um, the fact that in a university space, we can, um, we can draw upon um, our core strengths as an institution to answer some of these questions um, and to facilitate this process of learning and unlearning of the broader community. Any thoughts from either one of you before we move to um, the live questions? I think, as you said, expanding on kind of the knowledge base that is present about both the institution and Wilfrid Laurier himself, mm -hmm. um, is one of the strengths of a project like this, right? Creating that knowledge base, creating that research, um, and also expanding on the research that has been done, right? So thinking about all of the things that are celebrated in these narratives, but then where are the silences? Whose voices aren't traditionally included in these narratives? And how can we introduce some of those voices back into our understanding of these history? Because it's not... It's not that they aren't there present in the history, it's just often they get excluded from these broader celebratory conversations. Um, and I think repositioning these projects to have a broader understanding and a more complete understanding of the legacies and the complexities of those legacies is very important. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Caitlin. So I'll move to uh, the first question, um, the first live question. Uh, I'm going to ask um, Tedla to just um, weigh in on this a little bit because it dovetails with with um, some of what you talked about. So the question is, given some partnerships mentioned abroad, particularly between the University of Edinburgh and the city of Edinburgh, might there be a chance to expand this work uh, someday to our local areas, Waterloo Region, Brantford, et cetera, um, to explore local public history in a way similar to this project? Um, yeah, so I think it's already uh, there, it's already expanded because I have already been in touch with historical societies uh, in Waterloo and also Brantford. Um, 
I am in touch with uh, the libraries here in the city. And also I have spoken, I have conducted oral interviews with um, experts, authors, and residents already. Um, a person who has written uh, a book about the history of Waterloo. And perhaps the way the, the approach she took is quite similar to our approach in that she has written about the untold histories of Waterloo, what has been hidden, what has not been told. And I spoke to her in person. So she's part of the community and also a former student of the universities in, in our county. Um, so in a way it is expanded, but the way that the former universities I mentioned conducted their research is a bit different because um, Edinburgh and the University of Edinburgh had a similar type of involvement and income that was earned from the exploitation of uh, human labor uh, of Africans and also resources. Uh, it is a bit different in our case here, um, but if we speak of the city of Kitchener, the naming and so on, the, who is Herbert Kitchener? Uh, what is his relationship with the city or the university? And these kinds of questions might uh, be a bit different, but if we are actually saying about, you know, trying to address uh, and also be in touch with the community, then that part is already being conducted. If there's any further outreach, then uh, we might discuss that in the future, I guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next uh, question we have from the audience is, and there are a few uh, that are in this vein, uh, but I, I think I will, I will answer them all. Um, individually in any case. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I'm wondering why renaming is seemingly off the table from the start of this project. So uh, thank you for that candid question. Um, when I first thought about um, the Laurier Legacy Project, it is true that the, um, the decision was made quite early on um, that this the work of this particular team uh, would not explicitly take up uh, the question of uh, renaming. Um, understanding that there are other um, universities, well, I think there are other universities that have seemingly made the decision off the off the the hop to rename. Um, I actually think those conversations um, have a much longer trajectory and a much longer genealogy than this question would suggest um, with all due respect. Um, and I think um, that uh, what other um, institutions have done as Tedla mentioned in his um, conversation was to is to engage in um, kind of reflective uh, projects um, around reckoning um, with histories. Um, and in the case of our institutions across Canada, um, who also have um, challenging and complicated namesakes, um, you know, uh, to, to engage in that process of, um, of, of knowledge gathering and, and, and critical reflection of, of, you know, what the historical archive can tell us about uh, the legacies of these particular um, individuals. Um, for me, um, and I'm going to speak uh, for me as the, the head of this uh, project, um, that uh, a, a project that is based on um, archival research, um, creating this sort of repository, that is a um, upon which future conversations can take hold. This is a direction that I believe that the university um, should be moving in during this particular time. Uh, that something mm -hmm. um, like a name change is a lot uh, for um, a project of researchers to hold. Um, and that is a, frankly a conversation that I think is, um, is, is left up to you know, two constituencies, the broader university uh, community and all the various stakeholders in the university um, and, and, the, and, our, and our university leadership and our alum. It's not the mandate of this particular project um, to, to weigh in on, on, on name changes and, and such, but it is our job um, to, uh, to leverage the strengths of this institution in terms of being able to um, offer a repository of of, um, of, of research um, that we can hold. And then whatever conversations emerge in the future, that is, that is up to, again, the university community as a whole. So this, is, this was for me never imagined as, uh, as the mandate 
um, of this work. And I think that's, that is a conversation that the university can table um, at, a, at, a, at, a later, at a later time, if it so wishes. Okay, um, and you know, I imagine there are going to be follow-ups to my answer, and that's okay. Please do send them. Um, the next question is, and I apologize in advance because I know I'm going to get the pronunciation of this wrong. Uh, my question, uh, or here's the question. My question is about the harms to the on uh colon, we the people of the dish with one spoon who have been denied access to the lands upon which WLU sits and the costs denied to them. Will this be addressed in your work? Um, Tedla, I'm going to turn to you to maybe say a couple of things. Uh, you did broach um, some of this in your um, in your presentation, um, some of the work that you've done and some of your reflections on um, the question of of uh, coloniality and and universities, and then I will I will follow up if that's if that's okay. Yes, that's okay. Um, so, like I mentioned earlier, uh, there is uh, currently an ongoing um, multiple university wide uh, research um, regarding the land grant to universities. Uh, this involves Wilfred. I mean. Um, University of Toronto, um, Simon Fraser, uh, McGill, and many other universities. York is part of this. And what they are trying to assess uh, is, is if um, the disposition of land, uh, of Indigenous land, was, you know, I mean, there are, in a way, it is, it is universities acknowledge that they mentioned they acknowledge that they are located on this specific land but is it approach is is there a proper reparative justice that's given to that so the question is do we have fair reparative justice and that's what they are actually asking and it's really an embryonic it's, it's still in the embryonic stage of the research but there are no findings there are no outcomes yet um and we we can't tell what has uh, the outcomes of uh, uh, these projects, but it's still in the initial stage. And I feel we are following the same kind of approach. And by the end of the, this project, I'd be able to tell. But I feel that there is a need for uh, reparative justice, and that's based on. Um, you know, the experiences from other universities that I've mentioned earlier. Um, I can give you examples, for instance, um, you know, universities in the UK, in the States, and some of the Canadian universities, including um, Dalhousie, uh, proposed these kinds of um, reparative justice measures, such as official apologies, uh, memorialization, financial compensation, uh, or funding and establishing campus legacy projects. Uh, and very important, perhaps it might answer to your question uh, indirectly, I guess, is that they have started and engaged uh, with indigenous and racialized communities. Uh, they have launched projects that benefit uh, indigenous and racialized communities uh, within the areas that the universities are located. Thank you um, for that very thoughtful answer, Dr. Testa. I will quickly say um, that I know that this, um, this question um, about uh, the, the denial of access to lands um, to the original care keepers of the land upon which WLU sits is, is one of the things that will be taken up um, uh, by the um, by, by Dr. Thomas, uh, by the Indigenous scholar that we hope to, um, to bring to the university. Um, and um, I think that those particular sorts of questions and the ongoing importance of um, the reckoning uh, with, with the truth of, of this question um, and, and how, as Dr. Um, Desta said, we, we move towards um, some um, understanding of reparative justice, I think is, is gonna be key um, to, um, you know, 
conversations mm -hmm. that will emerge out of the foundational research that's done um, during this during this project. Okay. Um, Another question about the name change. Uh, will WLU uh, follow the lead of Toronto Metropolitan University and change its name? Will this question be considered as part of this project? So, um, you know, my answer to the first to, to the similar question that was posed earlier is no. Um, a name change will not be considered as part of this particular project. Uh, the role of this project, again, and I sound like a broken record, is to create a repository upon which the university can um, build a foundation for all sorts of um, discussions about its future. Um, so there's another question that is to follow about Toronto Metropolitan University as well. Um, and I, I suppose for many people, this is going to be uh, the kind of um, primary example of sort of what, what the outcome um, should be or could be um, from even um, a conversation uh, like the one that we're having about, about, uh, about you know, a, essentially a, a public um, education and research project. Um, what I will say is that while Toronto Metropolitan University uh, made a decision uh, to change its name, and it's not my place to question um, that decision. I think for that university, it was a good decision. Um, you, you know, it does raise questions about the work uh, that, that um, and these are some conversations I've had with colleagues. You know, we might ask ourselves some questions about what exactly is is the work that we that we want name changes to do that we think they will do um in what day in what way do they substantively address questions around um you know historic racial exclusions histories of decolonization the questions of reparative justice that tedla mentioned uh for me those are the questions that are um most important and that's why we're doing this research project so we can have an informed a kind of understanding of our history and move towards a more nuanced understanding of our present um in the absence of um in the absence of those more substantive uh things um that i mentioned i think there's some some questions that folks could ask about um about uh, about name changes and and some and so and I, and I'll be frank some questions about whether um whether those name changes um have been um also um been partnered with the kinds of more um systemic uh changes um that maybe some people had had envisioned uh, so for me it's it's most important to and again I don't want to go on too much about name changes because that's not our mandate but for me it's more important to think about addressing colonial legacies in substantive ways and I think a name change um I think it's an open question whether or not that actually gets you there uh, as an institution I know that many people might uh might disagree um with with what I just said but I think I, I I'm 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 interested to see uh what the long term effects in terms of um in terms of making universities more welcoming, um, more egalitarian spaces, um, if proponents of name changes um, can, can will be able to say in three four years that that has had the desired effect. But again, this project is not about name changes. But I understand um, that in a project like this, um, the one that we're having, the one that we're we're um, we're overseeing, there are going to be lots of questions that lead us to the the name change issue. Okay. Um, next question. Having a more complete and nuanced understanding of a historical figure is important, but how do you expect the common community member to learn all that information to understand that the name of WLU is not direct, is not a direct commemoration and celebration of all aspects of his legacy? So do either one of you want to weigh in on this? I can um I can read it again because it's a very complex question. And I think that this um, might be the last question that we're gonna have time for. There's another question um, that has come in about um, Egerton Ryerson that um, I believe I addressed um, in my comments. So um, do either one of you wanna try and tackle that question? Should I, should I read it again? 
Okay, so having a more complete and nuanced understanding of a historical figure is important, but how do you expect the common community member to learn all that information to understand that the name of WLU is not a direct commemoration and a celebration of all aspects of his legacy? All right. Um... This project is very much about gathering research um, and kind of that repository of knowledge on Wilfrid Laurier. Um, I know for myself, jumping into the archives, it's really intimidating. And I'm I'm a trained historian. I've gone through almost a decade of graduate school to kind of learn these skills. Um, so part of what I'm doing as I'm going through the archive and kind of finding more out more about Wilfrid Laurier and his legacy is how to kind of leave that research for future scholars, um, for anyone interested in it, frankly. Um, so collecting that information is part of the project. And as you said, sharing it is the other part. Knowledge mobilization is a big part of this project. Um, so an event like this is kind of a starting point of how to share that research. Um, and for me today, it was very much about the questions of the research, but how I leave that behind um, is also important. So hopefully for me, I'm very much hoping to leave a more kind of expanded um, record that is a lot easier to jump into to find out in this information to kind of jump into the archives with a starting point in place um, and kind of beginning there for future researchers and people who are interested in the future. Thank you, Dr. Iraq. And I will now turn it over. Well, let me first say, I think that that will be our last question because um, we're running right up against time. If there are any, and we did get through um, virtually all of the questions, there might've been one or two that we didn't get to. Um, so we just encourage folks to submit um, their questions after the event and we will um, do our best to endeavor to answer them. And I'm gonna turn it um, over to Dr. Mystery. All right. Um, so thank you again to everyone for attending. Thank you to the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada for hosting today's event. Um, a special thank you to Dr. Barrington Walker, Dr. Darren Thomas, Dr. Ted Ladesta, and Dr. Caitlin Arak, Aisha Owan, Matt Baker, Eric Story, Liz Brown, and Asma Ko for putting all the work in to put this event together. We really appreciate all of your hard work for the past few weeks. It's been a lot. Um, and I also want to just say thank you to everyone here, who's here today who joined us for the Laurier Legacy Fireside Chat. We do hope to see you again for further public engagement, um, and we will be posting information about upcoming events on um, this page that I'm just going to drop in the chat in a moment. Um, and then we will also be circulating this survey, which I'm also going to drop in the chat, but, um, but please do complete this feedback form to engage further with the event. Um, and with that, I just want to wish you a good afternoon um, and thank you so much.